Ladies and gamers, welcome to Bill Noir TV. Today we have another Cast My Game community cast for you, a series where I cast your replays. But today we have an exception because we have a special guest. It's not going to be me, therefore I. It is going to be we, therefore me, and a special guest, Nostalgia Talex, over from the uh, from the from across the Atlantic, from Canada, Calgary. Welcome, man. Welcome on the stream. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you doing today? Awesome. Uh, I actually this was a this was a pretty uh, weird coincidence that we kind of like bumped into each other. You know, you just sent me a tweet like, "Hello there. <laughs> How about we do a cast together?" And uh, I'm like, "Hmm, this guy is favorite caster of of uh, one of my frequent viewers." David Thor, hello in the chat. <laughs> so I'm like, hey, sure, Thor. why not? <laughs> uh, yeah, so yeah, I've, I've known David Thor actually for quite a long time back in my stream, uh, quite active there like a year and a half ago when I was streaming a lot more than I am now, unfortunately. Okay. And knocking things over. So before we do get into the actual replays, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Because most of the guys here in the stream probably. Uh, apart from the people that you kind of dragged with you, uh, probably most of them are uh, are Europeans, so probably never heard of you or very little. So give us a give us a rundown on what you do, your background, what you're doing currently. Okay, sure. Um, so I've been casting StarCraft Two since November first, two thousand eleven. I'll always remember that day because the night before, I went to the movie theaters on Halloween to watch Ghostbusters in my Ghostbusters costume. That was pretty cool. Um, so I just that day always will stick in my head. Uh, I started casting um, just regular fan games, um, kind of like what Bell Noir is doing right now with uh, casting, you know, cast, cast my game. <laughs> <laughs> I used to do that kind of my own thing back in the day. And uh, from there, I started casting more and more, smart, doing small tournaments, uh, doing show matches and all that kind of stuff. And then I was eventually invited to be a caster for Play Him TV, which was a huge opportunity for me. So I did that gladly. And... Uh, at the same time, I also was uh, asked to do world, the World Championship Series, which was really cool. So I cast it for WCS. Um, I did their Canadian qualifiers, as I'm a Canadian, so it just made sense. And uh, Oh, wow. I didn't know yeah. that. Oh, yeah. So I've cast it for World Championship Series. And then I've even done some big things. Like I've been on Chan Man V's stream, and we did a show match between Tamaka and White Raw together. When that was, was really this? <laughs> this was, oh, gosh. Um, the World Championship Series was last year because it was the first yeah. year of the World Championship Series. And then... Oh god, the Demaga White Rock thing was eight, nine months ago, probably now, maybe, maybe even ten. But um, and then uh, I kind of fell out for a bit because I had to get a real job because I was streaming constantly, four hours a day, every day, yeah. without getting paid. So I, I eventually ran out feeling. of money. <laughs> yeah, I eventually ran out of money. So I had to, I had to get a real job, and uh, so I had to stop casting for probably about like six, seven months. But then I jumped right back into it, and I was just like, hey, let's keep going. And since then, I've been invited to cast things. Um, I did uh, the Great Northern SE2 uh, tournaments recently. I'm a caster for the UASL right now, which is the Union of America StarCraft League, which is a Pan America League. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm just looking to cast everything basically. So I just yeah, I know. Cast. I, uh, I I heard you made a comeback a couple of months ago. Uh, yeah. Probably like three or four. You started casting again. And all right. So uh, as we as we go along, guys, uh, don't mind me just plugging some of the stuff that Talix is doing. Uh, over over in the in the Canada and uh, in the US uh, regarding the stream you're tuned in right now again this is Belmar TV cast my game where we cast your replays that you sent us um, basically if it's a 1v1 if it's a master versus master if it's between 10 to 30 minutes long approximately exceptions can be made just send it to me to belnoir at cesnam.cz title uh, the email cast my game include a short description so that we know what is going on in the replay and I don't have to watch it because that spoils all the fun and uh, then it might get selected and uh, we'll cast it so let's get into the first replay uh, we already have a nice party going here with uh, with Talex, So yeah just on the ball with that one I just jumped in I'm like hey let me find everything <laughs> I have to say that Talex is so professional. Like I logged into StarCraft and I, I he already I already had a message from him in the chat and he was in the group chat channel. Like he did his research. This guy is so pro you wouldn't believe. I also just want to throw something out there just because I I love the look of your stream. It's so film noir. 
Like it's very like Chinatown or yeah, Blade Runner. It was it was so designed cool. that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's just I came. From, I used to. I went to film school prior to oh, casting. I used to make really? video games for a living. So just when I was in college, I got to really learn to appreciate. Even though I was in video game design film and stuff so when i see film noir i'm just like oh fuck yeah <laughs> yeah that, I mean, that was <clears throat> that, that, that was the basically the theme we went with uh with uh, the, the graphic designer that did this i'm like i have to get something that is corresponding to my nickname and i yeah. love those old black uh, black and white movies you know the noir genre so i wanted to lo look like look like the 40s or the 30s like film noir it whatever you however you like and he was like yeah. sure i'm gonna do that like <laughs> like the guy between the two of us totally reminds me of casablanca like you know yeah I mean? yeah exactly that was <clears throat> that was actually my idea i'm like i need a logo for 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 the brand and it needs to look like humphrey bogart but not yeah. exactly like him and he's like cool <laughs> i can do that <laughs> yeah and i think that's perfect because i saw that and my first thought was like yeah, that's totally casablanca but then everything else just makes me think of other film noir yeah, yeah, Casablanca, one of my favorite movies, and then you know uh, classics such as Chase, Heat, and mm. stuff like that. It's like never, go. never dying movies. All right, let's yeah. jump into the first replay. It's going to be um, a TVP on Red City, one of the new maps, and uh, we're gonna have ourselves a Master versus Grandmaster battle at Terran versus Protoss. Yeah, definitely not one of the maps I say is the best for Terran. There's just, like, no place ever to put production facilities. It's crazy on this map. <laughs> like, you can't build production facilities anywhere, which is fine for me because I don't play Terran, so I just laugh at them when they try to do production. But yeah, that's, uh, that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is I check if I switch my overlay. Yes, I did. The <laughs> other thing is that... Um, uh, there's a lot of chokes here, so obviously it's good for Protoss because you can just storm and Colossus away all the damn time. Alright, so I'll go ahead and introduce the players in the top. We do have the Red Terran player Gwynblade from Team Angry Bunnies. Uh, he was the one that submitted this replay. Best yeah. team name ever, jeez. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and in the bottom, we're gonna have ourselves uh, the Blue Protoss from Team My Insanity. Uh, based in Switzerland, it is going to go ahead and be mind blowing. Wow, My, what a mind blowing name, hey? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so Talex, do you expect anything mind blowing happening in this replay? <laughs> well, I, I can say on a map like this, um, things like uh, Reapers are pretty good just because there's a lot of place for them to jump and hide. So, I'm probably, and I'm just, I'm throwing it out there because I don't know because I haven't seen this game, but I, I would be, I would be shocked. If Gwynblade probably didn't open with at least some sort of Reaper harass. Yeah, it seems to be the the pretty standard current meta game for the Terran players. Well, if he was opening up with a Reaper, he would probably be getting a gas on 12 yeah. or 13, the latest. He's not doing that, so probably just a very standard gasless opening, which um, I have to say is not the best idea recently, uh, just because of the huge numbers of possibilities that a double gas opening Protoss has. Which is what we are seeing right now from mind blowing. Yeah, that's definitely a good point. Yeah, we would have seen something down there by uh, Gwynblade by this point. So just by what it looks like, it's going to be the early one Rax expand, which is totally good for your, uh, you know, your economic play, your macro play. But you also got to be really careful of that one probe that's moving around the map for Protoss because hidden pylons can really do a good number on Terran in the early game, which is why it's always nice to make sure you have the map control to uh, stop that kind of thing. Yeah. And the Reaper also gives you a lot of useful scouting information. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, you, you can you can scout things like um, a uh, Stargate or the lack of pylons in the Protoss base or uh, or a Twilight Council, fast Twilight Council or, or whatever. And uh, some players have been experimenting with fast Warprism res uh, recently thanks to the speed buff as well. So you can see sometimes a fast Robo going down. Gwynblade finally... Uh, putting that supply depot, which prevents mind blowing from scouting his main base, doesn't know if he's got a gas or not, but he did see that expansion. Yeah, that's actually really good knowledge for him. So, you know, from this point, we can really kind of determine what exactly it is that mind blowing wants to do. We can see that, you know, he made a zealot stalker. Um, you know, after this pylon finishes up, I mean, he's already got a lot of people in gas. My my thought is we're probably going to see the Twilight Council into blink stalkers, but that's just my opinion. Hmm. And it's so effective too. It's a really strong build. Just like the Reaper, there's a lot of place for them on this map. You can get them on the high ground towards the natural, you know, over the ramp. This can do a lot of damage. You can go straight up into the main, and you can just be very harassing with that. 
Yeah, you can. So we have one Stalker, second Stalker, even being Chrono Boosted, still no Mothership Core, uh -huh. and this tells me that Mind Blowing definitely is uh, going to be aggressive yeah. versus Gwynblade here. Gwynblade doesn't even have a bunker yet, and that versus a Zod and a Stalker alone with just four Marines is going to be problematic for him a little bit. Yeah, I'm kind of be interested to see how exactly he wants to hold this off. Obviously, you know, he is making Marines one at a time, but it's going to be pretty hard now. We do see that Stalker is catching up to that Zealot. He's basically going to have to kill the Zealot before the Stalker gets there, but that's not going to be the case here. Hmm. Yeah, and now he'll have to micro like a god. Let's look at the health, and those Marines too are already damaged. Uh, Mind-blowing target firing very, very well with the Stalker and the, and the Zealot. Uh, and the Stalker can take out potentially two more Marines here before it goes down with good kiting. Gwynblade already ranking up that resources lost tab. And, you know, losing one Zealot, not a really huge deal. A second Stalker joining the fight. Gwynblade in a lot of trouble right now, having to pull four SCVs to deal with just two measly Stalkers. Yeah, and I really like what Mind Blowing is doing behind this. He actually went for the faster expansion, um, you know, just so he can kind of keep up with the fact that his opponent did go with the earlier Command Center build. Obviously, these Stalkers are not going to be able to win the game, but they're going to be able to do some good damage, and he knows that he's going to have to get that down eventually if he wants to keep up in the macro game. Hmm. And meanwhile, in the Protoss base, we don't have any... Oh my god, what the hell am I seeing in the in the Protoss base? Double Stargate and a Forge? Whoa. Wait, what? <laughs> this is the first time I see anything like this. I mean, Double yeah, I Stargate? This late? Well, Double Stargate, but it's the fact that the Forge is there too that's really confusing me, especially this early on. Obviously, you're not going to be able to support properly on both of those um, and then, you know, still eventually keep an army going. The Forge might be there to get shields and then, you know, want to go for very, very heavy air tech um, for a Protoss, but I definitely think, you know, getting those Stargates out, getting a little bit of an army, then eventually getting the Forge may have been a little bit better because otherwise, if you take a look at his natural right now, like, he's only got two probes mining there because everything has to go into gas. He's getting the shields upgrade, or the armor upgrades, so wow. <laughs> oh, the SCV, the SCV gets in the scout, he sees the double Stargate and the forge. Gwynblade knows exactly what is up. And he knows well, he's I, probably going to be up versus Phoenixes, because for Oracles, you would not commit such heavily into two Stargate play. Uh, yeah. Because they're not as useful later on when you have uh, a lot of Marines out. Yeah, it, it's kind of depressing seeing how the Oracles have kind of fallen out since the beginning. I mean, when Heart of the Storm first came out, oh my god, everybody used Oracles against Terran. That was just the thing. These days, people are being a little bit smarter. They're going for Phoenixes. Um, they want to play that kind of game. But then also Stargate is, in my opinion, in just in general, not just with Oracles, but it's fallen out just a little bit as well. Hmm. That is absolutely true. Now, three Phoenixes are already out. Uh, fourth one joining them and two additional ones being chrono boosted. No missiles, m missile turrets up yet for Gwynblade and that's a mistake I have to say. I mean he did see those Stargates going up. He can't just rely on Marines because no matter what is going to be produced out of that Stargate or those Stargates, he's going to need all of his Marines together, bunched up, dealing with the air units and that will leave his mineral lines exposed and um, vulnerable to any kind of air harass, be, be it oracles, be it void rays, be it phoenixes. And he is going to push ahead with these marines right now. The stim is done and plus one is being uh, close to completion as well. Medivacs are already uh, in production. These phoenixes will shut down those medivacs very, very fast though. And that army without healing, well, it doesn't have that uh, much of a longevity, does it? No, that's definitely a very good point. And behind this, of course, we can see that, you know, Triple Gateway has been put down. The Twilight Council has been put down as well. I think this might just eventually be a transition into maybe getting some Archons with Zealots. Um, it makes sense with getting that armor upgrade. It would make those Zealots just even stronger. But it all depends whether or not maybe he wants to go Dark Shrine. I mean, there's so many different things that he could do. I'm just interested because already seeing the Double Stargate and Forge into Twilight Council with a whole bunch of gateways, I'm just like, I don't even know what he's doing right now. <laughs> it's just crazy and awesome. It's just a very, very crazy opening. Maybe, maybe mind blowing. Just wanted to open phoenixes to uh, be very, very safe versus drops. Drops on this map are partic particularly obnoxious. Yeah. Uh, very, very difficult to deal with, even with blink stalkers. Having a flock of phoenix uh, flying around and uh, denying those drops is a uh, very useful asset to have. Um, and looks like the transition for mind-blowing is going to be void rays and charge lots. This is very yeah. smart. 
Yeah, this will actually be a really, really great transition, just because Zealots are obviously going to be taking all the damage of the Marines, while the Void Rays are going to be in the back. They're going to be able to clear up the front lines. They can do things like kill off the Medivacs so fast, especially when you're pumping them out two at a time, because you have the double Stargate tech. Yeah. And look at Mind Blowing. He's even splitting up his Phoenixes. He's going to be patrolling uh, them around, or just looking for drops, looking for Medivacs, before they even anywhere close to his bases. Gwynblade is taking a third base, um, he's getting plus one armor so far, so he's just playing this very, very, very standard. Uh, getting an armory and a second engineering bay will be adding on more racks uh, in due time, and uh, Viking production is started. Now, Vikings are going to be essential in dealing with those void rays, but he ne he'll need pretty much, I think, even more Vikings than, y than you would ordinarily get versus Colossi-based armies. Yeah, definitely. Now, we can also see on top of the whole Void Ray production, the Dark Shrine did go down, so it looks like we probably will see Archon, Zealot, Void Ray. This is just a very gas-heavy build for on being only on two base. Like, I definitely think the Mind Blowing needs to get that third base if he wants to be able to do this kind of an attack. Mm. The Phoenixes are away, and the army is attacking into the natural, but oh my god, look at those force fields, the Void Rays. Uh, are starting to work on those marines, but going down one by one, the photon overcharge helping quite a lot, and now the phoenixes are coming back, lifting up almost everything they can. Will Mind Blowing survive this uh, attack? It looks like it. Most of the marines are already dead, all that's left are marauders, and that Void Ray will be able to uh, kill at least some of them, uh, and the phoenixes will take care of the rest. More reinforcements coming in for Gwynblade across the map, though. This is going to be a very close fight for Mind Blowing to uh, uh, to win, if he even does that. Yeah, definitely. All right, well, I do like that there was a Widow Mind that's brought down here. Oh, if those hit the... Oh, oh it didn't hit the Void Ray! Yeah, I would have loved to have seen that actually go and hit that Void Ray because that would have helped him out immensely because Void Rays are so expensive. Behind this, though, you know, Gwynblade, he is just going to try to resupply. He is making his bio army. He is getting a whole bunch of reactors right down now as well. So it'll be interesting. Um you know, just how much he's going to be able to produce now that he's on three base versus his opponent's just two base. Hmm. And I don't think, I don't think uh, Mind Blowing is in a position that he could take a third base. In fact, I don't even, mm. I don't even think he uh, intends on taking a third base. He's got perfect saturation in both the bases, uh, perfect uh, probe count uh, for that. So he's just going to be pushing and he's got a lot of charge lots on the ground with Archons and Phoenix support. This can be very bad for Gwynblade. I mean, he does have a higher supply of, uh, of food in general, but a lot of that army is in, uh, or at least part of that army is in Vikings, and uh, he doesn't have that much on the ground. He does have 24 Marines, but the charge lots, well, with the Archons, they're just going to be pushing that back and back and back and letting the Void Rays do the damage they need. Yep, definitely. It looks like Mind Blowing is going in for his attack now, but we take a look at that supply tab. As long as Gwynblade can kind of hold this next attack, he'll be in a pretty good position. All right, a pylon is being put down here by Mind Blowing, a very, very aggressive pylon by the fact that it's right inside the army of his opponent. But here we go. There is another pylon that's down. The attack is on its way. Zealots charging in here towards the third base. Marines stem up. A little bit of a stutter step going on. The Void Rays in the back. He put their charge up. Looks like even the Phoenix is trying to get into this game and do as much as they can. The Archons now pushing the entire bio army back. But some Widow Mines do go down and get some pretty good hits off there on those Archons. And it looks like Windblade is going to be able to push forward here and defend this third base before it does fall. Yeah, without the ground army to support those Void Rays, this army is suddenly way, way, way weaker. The Marines have good upgrades versus the Gateway army, but here comes a reinforcing round of Stalkers. Mind Blowing knows that as long as he can uh, get rid of the anti-air, the Void Rays will continue to rule the battlefield uncontested. The third base falls, but Gwynblade still not out of this. Widowmind is doing a ton of damage to the Stalkers and keeping him alive or helping him in that. Yeah, definitely. Now, we did see those SCVs run up to the top there. I mean, with the Void Rays doing all the damage to the to the command center, I think they probably could have kept them alive a little bit longer with the repairs, so some of the Marines could have got a couple more kills on those Zealots, but otherwise, still a really good place here for Gwynblade. Despite losing that third base, his supply is looking very, very strong. Constant Widow Mines coming down. There is no detection here for Mind Blowing, so those are just doing so much damage whenever they get in range. Oh, yeah. And now we have only three Stalkers, one Archon, three Zealots, and one Void Ray remaining here. If Gwynblade pulls his SCVs, this is what he is doing. He's definitely trying oh, wow. to get rid of this army. The reinforcements are already coming in. And oh, wow. Gwynblade leaves the game before, before he plays it out. 
really? I didn't think he was in that bad of a position. Now, the problem for, like that it looked like to me was just that he didn't have that production going. But Mindplane really didn't even have an army here. He was very, very all in there with only having 64 supply. And there were still Widow Mines on the field. Yeah, there was, and no detection. I mean, he could have gotten an Oracle, but look at the reinforcements here. One Archon and four Zealots. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I don't know. I, I mean, this this could have been this could have been dealt with, in my opinion. Yeah, Gwimblade, man. I think you I think you could have had that. And it's oh, 57 it's a... because he did have a widow mine at the natural of uh, mind blowing the whole time. It it ranked up nine kills during all of that wow, battle. Yeah. And, uh, you know, mind-blowing 36 probes to 57 SCVs. Granted, Gwynblade would have lost a lot of those SCVs. I estimate 15, 20 SCVs maybe, but he still would have been so far ahead in Econ. Yeah. No, I definitely agree. I definitely think... I, Gwynblade in chat saying he didn't realize that it was wow. all in, but, I mean... I think if he had just held this attack, the constant resupply from Mind Blowing wouldn't have been enough, and then eventually Gwynblade could have taken that upper hand, especially with that Widow Mine at the natural base of Mind mm. Blowing. That eventually would have just ruined any type of resupply. Yeah, definitely. So, <laughs> guys, just uh, take a lesson from... Uh, take a page out of Gwynblade's book. Never <laughs> GG before it's time to GG. It's better to have that <laughs> fantasy GG timing than to have than to have an Idra GG timing. Let me tell you that. Yeah, definitely. Well, otherwise, still a pretty good game, but uh, it all comes down to it. Terran just didn't have enough supply, or, or um, I guess you could say production <laughs> facilities, but <laughs> how, how could he? He doesn't have any room. <laughs> 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 There's nowhere I can There's build. I don't have any real estate. <laughs> Barracks in the sky, they're flying. <laughs> oh, you're a huge Beatles fan. I can, uh, I can already tell. I just, well, I like the Beatles. You know what the song... Yeah. Uh, Lucy in the sky. Yeah, in the sky with diamonds. Yeah. You know what the what the uh, first letters of uh, every uh, single noun in that in the title of the song? Like if you if you say the sentence "Lucy in the sky with diamonds" and then take only the first letter from each noun. L i t s w d. No, only noun. Only nouns. Oh, no, oh I'm no. sorry. Only noun. Okay. So the first one is Lucy, obviously, right? So it's LSD. Oh, LSD. Oh, yeah. <laughs> D wait, don't tell me you didn't know that. I didn't. Oh, wow, really? No. I mean, the Beatles were accused of uh, of promoting drugs uh, with the name of the song. Every... People can find anything in anything. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, I know. Oh, Elvis died. Oh, my! but Elvis is an anagram for lives. Oh, so Elvis must not be dead. <laughs> oh, widespread panic. <laughs> Defo. Uh, anyway. All right, let's go. Uh, let's go into the second game here. Yeah, sure. Thank you guys for watching, and uh, uh, tomorrow on Belmar TV we have a tournament. Uh, it's gonna go live at 4 p.m. Central European Summer Time, so you might watch if you if you want to see some good action. Um, hopefully, it will not turn into a PvP fest because, like the 70 70 percent of people that have signed up are of Protoss race. So oh. after we after we close the brackets after after we do the check-ins tomorrow at uh, between uh, between uh, fifteen thirty and sixteen, uh, I hope after we assign seeds and uh, compose the bracket, we will uh, not have a slew of PVPs from start to finish because that would ruin my day. Even though PvP is very interesting nowadays, and it, I think it's the uh, matchup that is evolving the quickest, uh, and it's changing the quickest, but still, it's like PvP. Uh, come on. I know, these days, I, I, I will say this in this entire season, PvP last season was just, it was so full of creativity. This season, it's like one person macros and loses because the other person four-gated. I'm like, this is not the way it should be again. <laughs> I don't want to go back to the four-gate losses constantly. Hmm. But, uh, all right, so it looks like we're going to have the ZVZ now. Yeah. We're going to have a... Uh... I don't know, maybe maybe a good game, maybe a bad game. ZVZs can go either way, man. Well, you know what? I bet there's going to be, um, starting off with maybe a spawning pool or a hatch, followed into Zergling, perhaps Bailing Aggression, and maybe one player goes Roach Hydra, maybe one player goes Mutalisk, and um, that's probably what we're going to see. <laughs> <laughs> probably what we're going to see. Uh, probably what we're going to see. Especially the map is going to be Akron Waste, so oh, the chances okay. of this game are ending very quickly are quite high, just because of the uh, openness 
of uh, the natural base, you know, Ling, uh, Baneling Orleans being very, very effective on, uh, on Aklon Wastes and generally on maps that are so much more open in the natural. Uh, the same goes probably for Whirlwind as well. Alright, jumping into the game. In the top, would you mind introducing the players here? Yeah, Alex? sure. In the top left-hand corner, as a red Zerg player from Team S Gate B, we have Hordeon. And in the bottom right-hand corner, as our blue Zerg here on Akalon Waste from Team Ecos, we have Slice. All right. Introductions done with, and it looks like Slice. Okay, okay. There is the Overlord. Oh, whew. I was a little bit scared for a moment because I did not see that Overlord for uh, for such a long time in the production tab. What is Slice doing? I was like, Slice. is he going to temple? He's but but he is already sending out a drone. Yeah, this is a really. Is he gonna like expand to his opponent's natural? Because that'd be awesome. Oh, it would be. No, it <laughs> oh, like please do it. I know this is I, every time I ever see anything, I'm always like, "Can there please be the best cheese ever I've, that I've ever seen?" But it just looks like the most early drone scout ever. Like this was just yeah. a super early drone scout. Um, I mean, spawning pool hasn't gone down, a hatch hasn't gone down. Like no, nothing. nothing is here yet. Like what are you what are you scouting at this point of the game? I think I think he's scouting for uh, for the pool, quite honestly. And there there, there he, he sees it going down. So he knows this is going to be a pool first, and it might impact his decision on whether he's going to go uh, hatch first or pool first. Or, most importantly, what he may be scouting for uh, as well is the gas timing. So it may, you know, if he sees the gas going down right now, he might be going for gas before pool. If he doesn't see it, he'll just go pool into gas. Yeah, no, I completely... I actually don't like this opening that Slice did. Me neither, I mean, but... He, he scouted really early, he did see the pool went down first, and he still went hatch first. I mean, that's yeah. fine, but I'm just like, then you left before the gas geysers came up. I'm like, you need to see these things, man. You don't need to scout that early. <laughs> so he does see the does see the expansion going down anyways, and yeah. he's retreating that drone to regenerate some of those hit points, and getting a pool and, uh, and a gas as well back home. Uh, hold on, he is still gasless, but going to be taking a gas right now. So gas timings are going to be exactly the same. It's just that uh, Hordon will have uh, that Ling advantage over his opponent, and uh, he'll have the Larva advantage. Uh, oh my God! I'm sorry. I swear to God, I heard you call him Hardon, <laughs> and then I just had to. Move it, I'm totally <laughs> you know, immature. this is it. No, it's it's it, it's two words. It's Horde and mm -hmm. On. And you actually made the same exact joke one of my co-casters for followers number three and four did. He kept calling him hard on. Oh, I, I didn't even see hard on until I thought I heard you say it. Because <laughs> I, I see hordy on, personally. That might yeah, not be correct. Yeah, I know. It's, it's the I most intuitive thing to do, right? <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, that was awesome. My day is complete now. All right, well, we do have two Zerglings here from <clears throat> hordy on. You're gonna be <laughs> serious. You're gonna be laughing from the through the rest oh, of the totally. cast on this, right? Tired. You've ruined it now. You've put it in my head. It's one of those things I you didn't. cannot unsee this, dude. Oh. Inception. Inception has just I, happened. I, no, I, but I we can see now. Slice is chasing away Hordeon from his base right now. Slice is also the first person to try to get metabolic boost because Hordeon has been taking that quite late. You know, he's saving up quite a bit of gas right now, but I don't. Hmm. I don't know, is it going to be early roaches? Okay, no, there it goes. Spine pool did or start researching metabolic boost now, but that was just a little bit late there out of uh, Slice. Or out oh, of a couple of seconds, a uh, couple of yeah. seconds. Both players getting uh, Baneling Nests uh, down right now. And, uh, you know, whichever player is going to start being aggressive first, uh, he's going to have the initiative, and the other one will have to respond to that now. Um, it is practically going to go down to timings like do I make a one more round of drones or do I not do I think right. my opponent is going to be aggressive or, or do I not another thing is the gas uh, the gas supply um, a slice has been continuously mining gas and he's got a lot more than Hordeon uh, well not a lot more maybe 30 more uh, but he's still not going into Baneling's. Now we now we see first 10 lanes being built by Slice, Hordeon. He's uh, going to go into defensive mode, just getting two Baneling's, which is uh, the number you need practically at the start to defend versus uh, some kind of uh, speed rush uh, from your opponent. Uh, now those Baneling's will have to be perfectly positioned to defend this attack. Hordeon, 
Hordian did see those links running out of the base though, so he's producing mm. links of his own. He already has eight of them near the ramp. Speed is just about now to finish, so he's going to be perfectly fine defending this, even building a second spine crawler. Uh. Yeah, just in case. Good good play there from Slice. He was able to come in there and poke. He actually sees that the Bailings are there. Oh, he even manages to get one Zergling up here into the main. Gonna be able to scout around. Still sees he's on one gas. Plus, there's no Lair tech yet. So, that's some pretty good knowledge uh, there for Slice. He can kind of go back home and do whatever he really wants to at this point. We can say that he is getting his Zerg ground carapace right now. Um, he's getting a couple more extractors as well as Roach Warden has just been started, which is actually something I really like. Oh, yeah, but this is a mistake from Slice. He's not getting any banelings of his own, and no, he might no. get overrun now because Hordon is poised for attack. Oh, he wow, produced yeah. quite a lot of links, and he can make use of them right now while his uh, Roach Warren and Evil Chambers are building. Let's see if he actually tries to go for an attack, tries to make a run by into the main base, because remember, uh, you know, uh, Queen blocking the ramp, not gonna happen on this map unless you spend the energy to build a creep tumor in your main base. Oh, those uh, zerglings right there just high fived each other as they ran past each other. But okay, we can see now that Hordeon has gotten in here. He can see what's in Slice's main. A lot more zerglings actually did get produced here, so Slice will just be able to clear this up. Hordeon's staying at home right now. He did have uh, his zergling baneling right now. He is getting his own Roach Warren as well as the Evolution Chamber, but Slice is just slightly ahead right there. He will have the faster plus one missile attack upgrade as well as more roaches in the early game, mm. but uh, he has to be careful how he wants to engage this just because those banelings for Hordeon are going to be very good if they get some good engagements. Oh, they are. And uh, the lair for Slice is also delayed by quite a lot. Now, yeah. hold on, he might end up losing the third base. He might. I don't think it's likely, but uh, even if that happens, even if he loses the third base, he'll just have such a huge tag advantage over his opponent. He can go into Mutalisks at this point, but uh, from what I'm seeing uh, researching on Hordeon's side, I think he's going to go into Roach Hydra Infester probably. And uh, his opponent... Well, he is getting plus one range for his uh, roaches as well, so he might be getting the same kind of composition. Yeah, I definitely think we're just going to see the same composition here out of both of these players. So we can see Slice has taken the more natural third. Oh, here we go, an engagement. There's actually Banelings on the field now for Slice. Hordeon's going to be very careful. Oh, a whole bunch of Banelings for him as well. They're just looking for a place to engage. Good little pick off there by Slice to pick off one or two of those little Banelings. And the roaches there, they're just really good. So neither of these players really want to uh, engage quite yet. It looks like Hordeon does want to engage back at his uh, third base, but he's got to be very careful because those Zerglings from Slice, oh, running up, but they actually do turn around. Well, uh, Hordeon could not really engage in that position. He saw that yeah. he's uh, outnumbered with roaches, and he still sees that he quite doesn't have enough roaches to engage this force. Those Banelings doing some good hits uh, onto those uh, enemy roaches, but not quite enough. Roaches are very, very beefy. Uh, at uh, 145 hit points. The road speed, though, is way ahead of his opponent, and with those wow. uh, Roach reinforcements, he's going to have the plus one, he's going to have the uh, Glial Reconstitution finishing. 12 more Roaches on the way, he does have the Hydrogen finished as well. So this is a very good timing for Hordan to uh, attack into his opponent. He knows, or, or has to assume, uh, just by the attack timing, that he skipped gas on something, and he doesn't have a third base yet. Yeah, definitely. Now, there is a lot of roaches for Hordeon, but Slice, with his resupply on the ramp there, looking very, very good. Both these players right now do have that plus, um, uh, plus one attack, but Hordeon, or I'm sorry, Slice does have the plus one armor as well, so Hordeon does have to push back just a little bit, and we can see Slice will put these rocks down just to keep himself just a little bit more safe. Hmm. Yeah. Definitely. And, uh, you know, the concave was also um, not in favor of uh, the red Zerg player here. Yeah. Hold on. Well, he's still trying to pile up uh, a lot of pressure. And I think this is just about the time when he should uh, be considering droning up that third base. Uh, his opponent's Hydroden is down and will be finishing in about 15 seconds here. Plus two, plus two is on the way, so his opponent going heavily, heavily, heavily into Roach Hydra. Uh, Hordon just now getting his second Evo Chamber. Yeah, we'll have to see how this gets uh, kind of goes from here. We can see that Spine Collar did get lifted here just at the wrong second as the Roaches do kind of come in here and take a look at everything. Looks like they might even be able to pick off a drone or two, so um, not too effective. 
because they will lose. But I mean, even killing one or two drones, it's never really that bad. But in the main base, there was another couple of roaches who went that way. Queens will take care of those ones right now. Yep, only one drone killed. I have to congratulate Slice on splitting his army correctly. He left mm -hmm. a group of roaches defending his third because he saw how a few roaches actually slipped past the defenses into the natural base and he expected that a second uh, attack that Basically, he expected that that was just a diversion and another attack was uh, uh, on the way towards his third base. So uh, he left his army there, defended without any problem. Horton actually um, electing not to engage at all. And, uh, well, both players essentially doing the same thing. Uh, Slice being a little bit ahead on the upgrades for his ground army, though. Uh, uh, he's uh, he's gonna have uh, the carapace upgrade advantage, and he will have uh, his uh, muscular augments uh, upgrade completed faster. He already does have the grooved spines, making his hydras all the more efficient, and he's got a huge leg up onto the infestation pit timing as well. So his infestors will be out way sooner. Yeah, that's definitely true. But you also have to take it from this: the sooner the attack happens, the better it is for Slice. The longer yep. it takes, the better it is for Hordeon. He did have that third base up a lot faster, so it is, um, you know, properly saturated right now, as well as he's getting his fourth. So the upgrade advantage will be good, but those times do eventually run out as the opponents can eventually catch up. So you know, an earlier engagement gonna be better here for Slice. The longer it takes though, Hordeon will continue to take that advantage as he does already have a slight drone advantage, but not just that, his army supply right now is 120 to 94. Yeah, and he's got Hydras out and has had them for uh, for yeah. quite a longer time. If we look at the Hydra, hydra counts, it's 20 Hydras for Hordeon and only 6, soon to be 10, for Slice. So, I mean, Hordon is, a, is in a uh, really good position taking down those rocks uh, so that he gets an advanced warning uh, in case uh, his opponent decides to attack from there, but uh, mainly just assuming a defensive posture, trying to max out, and he's going to be going for an attack after he hits 200, and putting down his infestation pit uh, only just now. And he does see that Slice is about to take his fourth base. I don't think Horden is gonna go ahead and allow that ha to happen and not punish it. He can try to engage from the top side, uh, maybe even uh, snipe some uh, creep tumors there. And I wonder what is the late game transition going to be for both of these players because you know, when you're fighting Roach Hydra Infester versus Roach Hydra Infester, it's a little bit difficult to transition out of this. No, it's definitely true. Those are some of the, you know, the army compositions that you're going to want to kind of almost stay with because it's so yeah. effective. Honestly, my opinion is the first person to lose their army as a majority is going to be the person to lose in this game yeah, because probably. everything is so similar. Uh, it, it's just it wouldn't make sense for them to you know want to kind of go back in do some more resupply like at this point It's it's beef army versus beef army and the person with the better engagements could be looking the best uh, And the fungals are going to be key here th uh, And uh, if you take into account the armor upgrade that is lacking for Horde right now the fungals do go down uh, The majority of the roaches are gone, but there's still a lot of hydras remaining Let's see if Horde can take this fight. It doesn't look like it another fungal catching half of those hydras unguarded and Horden has to retreat still. Slice's army has quite enough of beef to push him back, but Slice has to be careful. He doesn't want to engage and overextend here uh, because Hydras do have quite uh, a lot of DPS, and Horden is making sure to always spread his Hydras into a perfect concave. So, so far, Slice being driven back. Let's look at the resources lost up. Not that far apart. Horden actually behind in this department. Yeah, it's very, very similar. I mean, the total supply is approximately 300 uh, minerals or so, or 300 resources. That is in Slice's favor. Plus, Slice has some really good creep spread on his side of the map. Hordeon is a little bit more centralized towards his side of the map because his creep spread isn't as good. And he's also got such a large Hydralisk count right now. You take a look at the Hydralisk tab. It is 36 in favor of Hordeon versus the 18 of Slice. But the problem is he doesn't have too much of a beef. He doesn't have that... He doesn't have the Rocky Balboas in the front of him, which I are going to be the Roaches here, basically, because they're the ones who are going to be taking the punches. And without those, the Hydros, they do fall really, really fast. Yeah, they do. And I mean, uh, hold on. He queued up Pathogen Glands just a couple of seconds ago or, or a minute ago, and then he ended up canceling it. I don't know if that was a mistake or he did it on purpose just to have enough gas for, uh, for further upgrades or something. Because he mm. does want to get into that plus three attack and plus two carapace as fast as possible. Now, one thing, uh, we do have the uh, Ultra Scavern going down for uh, 
uh, for Slice. Ultralisks yeah. with that armor are really, really beefy. If he gets them out in sufficient numbers, that might actually win him the game here. On the uh, And one other thing he could potentially try to do, you know, if your opponent overbuilds on Hydras, you can oh. actually try to go Banelings. That was not a good engagement there for Slice. He ran no, a lot of his all. army into Hordeon. Hordeon had a great split as well, so we're going to see Splice right now. He is resupplying with another 11 roaches, but he hurt his entire army a whole lot. We see, oh my gosh. Okay, well, a really good uh, concave right now for Slice, but the majority of the army is still in Hordeon's favor. Some good fungals go down, but Slice is now being pushed way back, and Hordeon is just looks like he's going to be able to push up here. Oh my god, he might even just be able to take this game. If these spine colors go down and there's not enough of a resupply, I think this could be GG. I think it is GG already. If we look at the supplies, it's 140 versus 140, but Hordeon is reinforcing way faster. The army size is dwindling here for Slice. The upgrades are starting to even up. He needs to get those Ultralisks out as fast as possible and Roaches with them as well. Forget about the Hydras at this point. You just need enough beef to withstand the remaining Hydra firepower present here for Hordeon. And uh, five Ultralisks on the way, but Hordon, he's just resupplying on Hydras, relying on their high DPS, saying, I'm gonna kill all your shit before it even gets to me. Takes yeah, down definitely. the natural base, and that's a huge dent in Slice's production as the Ultras indeed do come out. Yeah, Ultralisks are really good at chewing through Hydralisks, but they're also not very good at taking the Hydralisks damage. They do fall quite fast. And with this last Ultralisk going down, I think that is gonna be GG. Yeah, I can't imagine Slice staying in this game for very much long. There's a GG, and uh, after a, a very even game and one decisive uh, engagement, Hordon wins over his opponent. Yeah, definitely. So that was actually pretty good. I, I, I definitely think the big loss there for Slice was in the middle of the map when most mm. of his army actually just moved right into Hordeon's army. He lost a large supply. He had to resupply with a whole bunch of roaches. At that point, his entire army was in a bad engagement. He had to pull back into his main base. The roaches weren't going to be good in that situation. And then the Ultralisk took an extra like minute to come out. So, uh, yeah, really great play there. Yeah. Alrighty, let me just give a couple of shout-outs to the chat. Uh... Uh, let me see who is here as uh, Talex is just flailing his hands about randomly. <laughs> Eating my candy. So this is something I want to tell you guys just before the stream started. Me and uh, and Bell here. I, I don't know if you want me to call you like Bell or Bell Noir. Oh, Patrick. Bell, like, Bell is want. okay. Bell is fine. Yeah. So. So me and Bella the Ball over here, before the stream started, what we did is uh, we were chatting and I was eating candy. He's like, what is that? I'm like, I'm eating candy. He's just like, don't do that on the stream because it's really annoying because it was like shaking, trying to get my candy out. So instead, for the actual stream, I switched over to a different candy. Because We went to the candy store yesterday because me and my girlfriend just fat. So we just <laughs> went and picked up oh a whole bunch of candy. So I got like my spray candy here because it's a lot less annoying on the stream. So and we're not that fat. We're just not that skinny, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's really like a candy in a spray? Yeah, it's like a, here, check it out, it's like a sour spray candy. So it's just like you spray it in your mouth and it's like, and you get that sour taste, but I have really good, um, like I'm really good with sour and spicy food, so it just tastes like candy to me. It's good. Wow, you have all kinds of things in America. <laughs> I yeah. know you're from well, Canada, but you know. <laughs> We're, we're pretty similar, except we're just much nicer, obviously. So Yeah, and you can <laughs> chop wood. Americans are so fat they can't even yeah. get off uh, their chairs. There you go. I can't get off my chair anymore either. But Can you chop wood? I totally can chop wood. Are you kidding? Come uh, on, man. There you go. <laughs> Come on. But I totally a lot of the different stereotypes of Canada. One, I love hockey. Two... Yeah, we we went um, over that as <laughs> already. I'm scared of the dark, which I I don't know. Recently, You're scared I've been told of the dark. That, no, Seriously? okay. So this is something that's really interesting. Apparently, one of the stereotypes of Canada right now is that we're scared of the dark. I'm like, what? Who in Canada is scared of the dark? It's winter here, like ten out of twelve months. That means the sun is not around. We're always in the dark in Canada. Who knows? Hmm. It's yeah. also it's also one of the stereotypes I heard recently is you only drink milk. I don't know what's up with that. That's not a stereotype in Canada, but that's definitely a stereotype for me. I don't know. Right. If, if there's anybody in the stream here who's actually a fan of mine, they will know that I drink an ungodly amount of milk. Um, and, I mean, I, drank more, I drink more than what humans should be allowed to drink. Because I, 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 I can say because we use the proper, you know, the metric system, so I can say it. So 
a, like you get like a four liter of milk, right? Mm. Yeah, you get those big four liters of milk. I can go through one of those by myself in two days. And I do that wow. all the time. So, Doesn't it? Wow. Okay. Yeah. All right. So before we go into the final, into, into the final replay, I know you're running an event supposedly later on today. So what is it about? Uh, it's some kind of a tournament or... Oh yeah, I'm casting for the Union of America's StarCraft League. Um, that's going to be going on, but it's not going to be for like another five hours or so. But yeah, after after this later today, I will be casting for the UASL. It's getting pretty close to the finals there, so uh, it's going to be us really looking forward to season two pretty soon. So, so guys, it's uh, I think one a.m. or two a.m. CEST. Is it? Um, I'm trying it's to, I'm trying eight, to do the math eight hour, here. It's plus eight hours from. from yeah, your it's time. plus. It, yeah, that's right. It's plus eight hours. So if it's six my time, it's going to be two a.m. CEST yeah. your time. So yeah. two a.m. CEST, guys. If you're still awake, want to check that out. If you like Talix, if Talix is casting, just uh, tune into. Can you can you post the link into the chat? Actually. Yeah, sure. Let's go ahead and do that and, now. By uh, the way, I would also like to say that yeah. I love casting with Europeans because you guys pronounce Talix correctly. Because in North America, they're like, it's Talix, right? I'm like, not really. And they're like, well, it's T-A-L-E-X, it's Talix. I'm like, D how do you say the word tails, T-A-L-E-S? Well, you say tails. I'm like, yeah, so you say Talix. Like, that's just, that's how it works, guys. <laughs> um, yeah, probably. But, but you know, it's, uh, uh, it, it's like, uh, it's like you have one foot, but you have two feet, but, uh, but, uh, mm, yeah. you, you have like a goose, but a geese, you know? Yes, but, but the weird one is the moose. Yeah, it's not meese. It's it's no. like mooses, right? So No, it's moose. It's moose? The plural of moose. Okay, is it's moose. moose. Same, same with fish, right? I know this as a right? Canadian. Yeah. What? Like, so, no, same with fish. Fish is fishes, isn't it? No, it, fish it's not. <laughs> no? No, oh, fish is yeah, fish. No, in, in, I know it's moose. It's weird. Like, hey, check it out. There's seven moose over there. There's like no... Yeah more canadian sentence than saying the plural and you, of you say there is three fish in the pond you don't say there's three fishes that's true that's true you do say that ha, three fish got you the there and not i'm not even a canadian or an american yay for me and my uh, knowledge of english gra grammar apparently hey just like what's your first language come on um slovak is it, it's, it's, okay yeah. my first thing of language isn't english either so <laughs> oh it's uh -huh. french oh yeah. okay okay you have been forgiven there we go. All, All sudden, right, guys. I'm um, like the worst Canadian because I don't speak French either, though. <laughs> no, no so wait, wait a minute. Let me get this straight. Your first language is French, and you don't speak it. How yeah. do you, how do you I've, communicate with your family, with your parents? Like like you go into your house and you're like, hi, hi pa, hi mom, and everybody's like, get out of here, you traitor. No, they they speak English to me. Yeah. My mom is like a little old French lady. So let me give the story. So Canada is split up into two different um, yeah, the, the, the Quebec languages. and the rest yeah, of you've the got, country, right? You've got, like, you've got like the English side of Canada and then you've got the French side of Canada. French side of Canada is more like the uh, northern Ottawa, the Quebec, you know, some of the Maritimes. And then the wet, and the, more of the western side of Canada is more English with, uh, you know, like Alberta, BC and all that kind of stuff. My yeah. entire family is from Quebec. But I was the one person in my entire family who was born in Calgary which is in Alberta, which is the Western side of things. So I grew up speaking French as like a little stupid child. And then because I couldn't say English words very well, they made me start speaking English as my main language. And with that, my French kind of fell out over time. So je parle français, mais mon français c'est ne tremble pas. I have basically no saying, I can clue speak French, what you just said. <laughs> bad French, it's bad French. I have no clue what you just said, but I think, yeah. uh, I think Desro would be happy. There you go. Well, Desro is also from Quebec. So. Yeah, I know. Mark um, Oliver Prelo. Prelu, yeah. Or Pro or, or whatever. There's an X in there. How the hell do you pronounce X's? You don't, anyways, as yeah. far as I know. There you go. All right, let's go into into the final <laughs> game. <clears throat> yeah, let's the final it. game is going to be a PvP, guys, and uh, it is going to be somebody named uh, Phaser versus Fnatic Harstam. So I'm putting my money down on Harstam. What about you? Um, just because I want to play the opposite side of that card, I'm going to go with Phaser. All right. Because I think he's going to phase Harstam out of existence. <laughs> All right, so he's going to... Okay, let's <laughs> let, let's make it even more cheesier. He's going to phase Harstam hard. Hardy on. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, let's get this game God. Started. What? I'm gonna do this every time. Dear viewers, this stream is going to go down in the history of Bill Noir TV as one of the one of the funniest streams ever, apart from the stream where me and Jesse both wore hats live in a broadcast. Oh my God, hats! Okay, that's yeah. it. I gotta. No, balance. you're kidding! Oh my God, you're kidding me! Win. I gotta balance this stuff now. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, do they do they actually see it? I don't uh, know. They kind of barely do. Yeah, yeah they do. do. <laughs> There we go. What I'm, I'm the shit? Now. Okay, okay. Now, now you now you're a legit Bill Noir uh, streamer, caster, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you want to do the introductions? I do one. You do the other. Yep. All right. Okay. So in the in the bottom we have. Uh, I'm gonna introduce your player. Yeah, I was just gonna say you're doing mine. I'm doing yours no. now. We're gonna introduce your player first. So in the bottom on Star Sta Star Station we have the red Protoss player. Uh, Phaser from Team Eeriness, I think. Eeriness, maybe. Maybe he's not even on the team anymore. And in the top, who do we have here, Mr. Talix? As our blue Protoss player from Team Fnatic, the loser of this game. We've got our <laughs> <laughs> um, Kevin so. van der Koy is not going to be happy with with that statement. I I, I love Harstam, Don't get me wrong. I definitely yeah. think Harstam is the favorite to win here. But just like every movie ever, I'm cheering for Rudy here, which has to be Phaser in this scenario. Um, I'm always cheering for the underdog. Like uh, when the finals of the recent uh, WCS happened, you know, Innovation versus Solki. Yeah. In Korea, uh, yeah. I was at the at uh, at the DSCL at the time in uh, Netherlands, and we were casting, so I couldn't get to watch. But some of the other casters that were on a break, they watched it, and everybody was like, "Oh, Innovation's got this," and it was like two zero, three zero, and I'm like. Sulky's gonna win. <laughs> Everybody's yeah, like, like, not gonna happen. I, I can I can bet a beer it's not gonna happen. I'm like, it's gonna happen. <laughs> Ended up being four three for Sulky, so You wanna hear a pretty funny story? I'm pretty good friends with Millennium's Ghost user. Yeah. And uh I was having a conversation with him while those were going on, because it was really late and he's out of Europe at the time. And I'm just like, so who did you uh, it's like who do you think is gonna win? He's like, I've got I got a bet going on with cats right now, and I'm like, okay, what's your bet? And he's just like, if if innovation wins, he owes me a hundred dollars. But if uh, Sulky beats innovation, I owe cats three hundred dollars. And at that point, we it would like the series was already three zero for innovation. I'm like, oh, you're gonna wait a hundred dollars. Then like two hours later, I see him back online again just after Sulky wins. I was like, dude, I'm sorry, that's probably like all your money. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so uh, both players so far doing a very, very similar build, uh, apart from Harstam getting his core a little bit faster due to the fact that uh, Phaser wow. kind of uh, misrallied one more probe onto his left geyser and he's trying to mine with four probes off of uh, that assimilator. Not gonna work out, dude. Mm -hmm. And Harstam, before getting any stalkers or whatever, he's just getting a Stargate. That's a very good, uh, very good build to do on this map. Uh, Oracle openings are. Uh, are very oh my god are yeah, you both kidding players me are doing stargates one gate stargate please don't let it go into mass phoenix battles I that would be hate wicked those. and i gotta say you know what we're, we're picking on phaser here because he's got four probes and gas i just want to let you guys know that's obviously the new meta game so <laughs> you guys learn to starcraft here because phaser knows what he's doing <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably is. And Harstam, I don't know where he got that idea to just go with the Phoenix first, but I have to say it's really smart in case your opponent... Because look at the map, Harstam did not scout at all. So getting a Phoenix first actually is really smart, followed by an Oracle, maybe. Because if your oppon opponent opens up with an Oracle, the Phoenix is going to make you absolutely safe versus any kind of Oracle harass. But Harstam, we're seeing him getting an additional Phoenix out. And uh, let's see... What phaser is going to be getting out of that uh, out of the Stargate? He's trying to harass Harstam's base right now, but with that Mothership core out and just one Stalker, he has to pull back right now, and uh, that Stalker might even get lifted. Oh, yes, well. indeed it does. But let's see how good this is going to be useful here. So there is another Phoenix here that's going to be able to do some damage. The Zealot is chasing the other Stalker away, but this first Stalker here probably will fall. Yeah, it's definitely going to fall, and very good micro there by Harstam, saving that one Zealot, killing a killing a Stalker, albeit at the uh, cost of expanding uh, two lifts. Phaser just getting the first Phoenix of his own right now and adding on two additional gates. Let's see how the 
Uh, what the number of gates for Harstam is going to be? He's got two right now, adding on a third and an expansion, so he's going to be playing this uh, economically focused, using these phoenixes to scout. So he so he knows exactly the number of units, the types of units his opponent does have, and he does see the expansion as well. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, the expansion does go down here for Phaser. Harstam's is already down, so a little bit further up in that case. But Harstam is making an Oracle right now, which is, I think is going to be pretty cool. He's oh, he get castles. A scratch the mineral line. Oh, does he? Yes, he does. Yeah. Right as I say that, I become a terrible person. Well, Way to ruin think, it, Harstam. Uh, I think he kind of realized, or, or maybe uh, it was after he saw that Stargate. Yeah, I think definitely was after he saw that Stargate. And he was yeah. like, no, I can't get an Oracle because he's going to have Phoenixes as well. And Phaser, seeing that Harstam has a lead on the Phoenixes, he's dropping down a second Stargate. Harstam's still not getting one. And like, this is basically going to come down most probably to uh, who is going to get uh, any on Pulse Crystals first. Yeah, that's a really good point. So, I mean, yeah, this, we're probably going to be, like, counting that down. We're like, who gets the Fleet Beacon? Who gets the Fleet yeah, Beacon? Yeah, exactly. But uh, it's very, very uh, sky-oriented right now, and I love that it's just continuous Phoenix here. Nobody's decided to switch over to Void Ray because they won't do too good at this point. You really need a good uh, second base economy. You really need, uh, you know, a lot of uh, Stargates in order to get that efficiently. Otherwise, your opponent's just going to max out on, like, Phoenix and just run you over. Your yeah. your Void Rays aren't going to be any what useful. So it's, so they're just going to keep making Phoenixes here, guys. Just constant Phoenix production. It's basically like the Muta versus Muta situation. You just cannot ever stop making Mutalisks. And you have, to be sh uh, you have to make sure that while you're getting them, you also have to keep up with the upgrades. Harston getting a second Stargate right now. I have to say that Phaser got that second Stargate maybe a little bit prematurely because... I don't. I don't think he had quite enough uh, saturation uh, everywhere yet, just to get that Stargate that early. And Harstam, he's going to have a lead on uh, the air upgrades as well, getting plus one air already. Uh, let's see what the Phoenix count is: eight for Phaser, seven for Harstam. So Harstam is a little bit behind, and will be even further behind in a couple of minutes, because he's just only only on one Stargate, um, or has been on on only one Stargate for the majority of the game. Yeah, he's just finishing up his second Stargate right now, as well as the Fleet Beacon has actually gone down from both of these players. Phaser slightly ahead in that advantage by about, I'd say, 15 seconds or so, so it's not a big lead right now. Um, but that also goes, if the Fleet Beacon finishes up, if both players go for Anna and Pulse Crystals right away, and there's an engagement, Phaser might just do a little bit better. Hmm. Definitely. If, uh, if Phaser doesn't forget to queue up that upgrade straight up, and then attacks immediately, I don't think that plus one air uh, armor is gonna come uh, gonna come into play. I don't think it's gonna matter. I mean, as long no, as yeah. Phaser micros correctly and stays out of the range of uh, Harstam's Phoenixes, all he needs, together with the Phoenix advantage he's gonna have, uh, all he needs is a couple good hits early on, before Harstam's upgrade finishes. And if he gets a Phoenix lead in the first battle, that's going to decide the game or might decide the game. Yeah, definitely. We can see Anna Pulse Crystals just this second starting for Harstam. So Phaser does have a huge advantage, like you were saying, with the plus one attack upgrade, not going to be very useful if he can't hit his opponent. And getting that extra plus two range on the Phoenixes with good micro means that that is definitely a possibility here for Phaser. And, but we can see, you know, he does have the... Uh, the sentries, he is continuously hallucinating. It looks like he's trying to trick his opponent. He keeps hallucinating oracles instead of other phoenixes. Um, so, I don't know. A bit of a mind game there, I would say. Yeah. Now, let's see if uh, one of these players have a robo. No, they don't. I mean, they have detection capabilities of the Stargate if they build one oracle. But still, having an observer is way better because it's invisible. Um, uh, yeah, they're just going to be continuously scouting each other uh, each other out. Now, Phaser, of course, does, did not have the information that we have, so he did not know that there was a timing open to him with the Annie and Pulse Crystals. And uh, why I asked if there is a detection? Because Phaser's getting Twilight Council, and I would not be surprised at all if I saw a Dark Shrine going down very, very fast here. Yeah, I definitely think that's definitely a possibility. Okay, we can see there's quite a lot of Phoenixes here. We might actually have an engagement pretty soon if that were to happen. We do have 15 um, Phoenixes here, 4 Phaser, 17 for Harsom, plus there's that plus 1 attack upgrade for Harsom that's finished up as well. So right now his Phoenixes are a lot more powerful. But 3 Zealots, 4 Phaser do get into the natural expansion here of Harsom. Oh, 1 actually manages to get to the probes. A good force field here 
to uh, deny the other ones from going in, but it looks like he might actually be able to pick up one or two probes here, which can be really, really annoying, especially because he locked his own army away. He does get two kills already while the battle with the Phoenixes is happening. One of Phaser's Phoenixes does go down. Oh my god, look at those Phoenix flowers. And this is going to be a... This is going to be a really weird exchange. 17 Phoenixes versus 17 Phoenixes. How are the upgrades looking? Uh, well, we see Phaser prioritizing uh, level... He's actually just now getting a level 1 attack. So, Harston, uh, he will be getting an advantage in every single fight. But Phaser does come in. Harston not paying attention. Uh, but Harston having that uh, plus 1 air and soon to be having plus 1 armor as well. Uh, he's going yeah. to have a quite uh, a quite a good advantage in every single air fight. And as I said before, albeit a little bit too late, we do see a Dark Shrine coming down now. Do we have any kind of detection from Harstam? He does have a Forge down and one cannon. Where is that one cannon? At the natural base, and that's it. Oh, quite a lot of Zealots now going to be moving towards the natural base of Harstam here for Phaser. You might be able to pick up quite a lot. Actually, three looks like they're going into the main. The uh, Actually, everything is going into the main. So the Photon Overcharge does go down here to try to deal with these Zealots. At the same time, it looks like Harstam is getting his army prepared right outside the natural of Phaser. It looks like there might be the attack here, and it will be Phoenixes and a ground army versus just Phoenixes. Plus, Harstam does have that upgrade advantage right now. Let's take a look at that units tab right now. There is 16, 15, 14, 13 Phoenixes for Phaser. So he has more than Harstam, but Harstam's are being a lot more effective right now as to Stalkers in the mix. And not only that, but everything in the main base of Harstam was cleaned up. There is a couple of Zell towards the third base trying to deny that Nexus from going down. Harstam will just supply back in. And looks like he's going to keep going in for another push. Harstam with a big advantage at this point. Yeah, but he lost the majority of his Phoenixes. I don't know how the hell that happened, but he did. And uh, you know what they say, as soon as you lose air superiority in this kind of situation, you're pretty much screwed over by your opponent because he's just he's just going to kill all your harvesters. And you have nothing as a response. Oh my god! Oh my god! The main nexus of Harstam Space, 3 DTs slashing away at oh it. There's no. no detection anywhere. The Robo is only just now building, will not be done in time. Cannon is out of range. Uh, actually, it's not. It can detect those ZT. So close call there for Harstam, as he does end up saving uh, the Nexus and killing those ZTs that have morphed into an Archon. Let's see. Let's see if the third base. Yes, cannons are going or should be going down at the third base as well. Another engagement will be happening. Can Harstam uh, pick off the Phoenixes in the center of the map? Yeah, there is a lot of Phoenixes here for Phaser, but they are starting to fall quite a lot now as they've been running through cannons and other stalkers. So it looks like that uh, Phoenix count right now only behind by two at this point. And once again, they are still stronger Phoenixes. So it's a matter of the engagements at this point. But one thing to take quick note of, Harstam with that third base, Razor, or Phaser still on two means that Phaser is going to have to kind of go in for a huge all-in attack. Yeah. Look how many Zealots are on the field right now. Yeah, they don't have charge though. I don't know. No, uh, he's getting there he's now, getting charge right? though. He's getting charge. Yeah. So if he he's if he can overrun the ground army and take out enough phoenixes, he could make something happen here. Yeah, so, definitely. And you know, Harstam having mostly stalkers on the ground. Once that charge kicks in, it's going to be very very difficult for Harstam to keep those stalkers alive. Uh, at this point, it's all a matter of who has uh, more anti-air units. I feel like Harstam though winning the first. Uh, very important battle here. Uh, Archon's being morphed in as well, uh, which means uh, Harstam's Phoenix flock is going to have a harder time microing. He'll have to stay out of the range of the Archons at all times. If he loses those Phoenix in one Archon shot, oh my god, the Phoenix is flying over that Archon, uh, incurring a lot of that damage. Force field's going down, preventing those Zealots from charging in, but the Archon should be able to break that. Harstam so far in a decent position, but I think there is a lot more charge lots here for Phaser as there is uh, Zolots for Harstam. Once that sellout line evaporates, the Stalkers are going to be in trouble. Phaser even lifting them, more Archons getting moved in, and Phaser just decimating Harstam on the ground. Yeah, definitely a gigantic advantage has now come to Phaser. Harstam keeps sacrificing a whole bunch of Phoenix play right now. But let's take a look. Yeah, even more Stalkers trying to come in here to deal with this. Those Zelts with charge catch up so quickly and it looks like he's trying to power himself across the map right now there still is archons and a forward pylon here for phaser towards the third base right now morphing in some dark templar it looks like he might try to morph those right into archons and go for another attack yeah that's exactly what's ended up happening and even more dark templar coming in right now this third base is extremely vulnerable all the stalkers for harstam did get killed off here so we'll have to see how this goes there is 
two cannons here, but I don't think that's enough. But there God. is enough energy on this mothership core in about... Yeah, it just puts down the photon overcharge. 60 army supply versus 20. I don't I don't fancy Harstam chance Harstam's chances at winning this uh, winning this game. Mothership core does go down. The Nexus will fall very shortly, and after it does, the worker kill tab will just uh, start rising rapidly. And uh, at this point, Phaser can just move into the natural of Harstam and try to take that one out. Uh, Harstam does have mobile detection, so DCs are not going to be all that much, uh, all that important, nor be able to do that much damage. Harstam just now getting the Dark Shrine, not fast enough. And there we have the GG. Yeah, definitely. We do see that GG going down, and as I called it in the early game, Phaser taking that one. Wow, you have a you have a good. Uh... Uh, good nose for winners, yeah. man. Can, yeah, he you, phased them out of existence. Yeah, he phased them totally. Can you, <laughs> can you like bet on horses for me? Because you seem to have a knack for uh, knowing what the who the winner will be. Sure, I'll tell you what. The winner of the next horse race will be the horse with the name that is some sort of saying and or household appliance. It's the king of the ring, taken around the corner, up against shower curtain. <laughs> <laughs> Which race? <laughs> I, I don't the in the in the, in the second. Okay, the second race. All right. in, in the second race, it will be. This is <clears throat> my. And I failed that joke. <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> mm. It's all good. It's all good. So basically, what happened in that game was uh, Harstam delaying the detection quite a lot and taking taking one bad engagement for Phoenixes uh, with Phoenixes, but that didn't end the game immediately there for him. Uh, he mo he managed to crawl back uh, into it with the Phoenix counts, but uh, just not getting that detection and just kind of failing to scout his opponent out, despite having those Phoenixes, despite having hallucinations, you know, all kinds of uh, all kinds of stuff. Uh, he did not manage to foresee the charge lot switch from his opponent, charge lot archon switch that he that he did. This that was basically what killed killed him, and uh, I was really surprised Kevin not scouting all that much he never found that pylon uh, to the southeast of his third base yeah that was really and he close did see too. that on that his mini map almost, yeah i was gonna say that was in vision like yeah. he had knowledge of that and he, that he never like wh how much zealots does it take how many zealots does it take like four zealots you send them over and kill it and then you can utilize those to block the third from going up or whatever yeah he never definitely. did that kind of so i was i was kind of like harstam's this one guy where when uh, or who uh, plays really well or or is able is capable definitely of uh, putting out very very solid performances. Uh, yeah, go ahead and spray some candy into your mouth. Just uh, be a sexy man talk. with this. I'm I'm trying to make it tell a story while you're talking with my actions. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> God, and uh, you know, but sometimes he just makes these these glaring mistakes that a lot of platinum players would not have made. Yeah, it was really strange. I mean, when you watch that game, both players actually did make quite a few mistakes. Um, like in the beginning, or I guess towards the end there, Phaser, you know, he actually sacrificed quite a lot of Zealots in yeah. bad positioning, um, especially when he tried to take out that pylon, but he never finished taking out that resupplying pylon. Um, made a couple of mistakes in the early game by, you know, sacrificing one or two of uh, the Phoenixes that he really didn't need to. Um, and then, you know, eventually did lose that uh, count because he didn't have the upgrade advantage over Harstam. But then Harstam kind of went the opposite direction and actually started sacrificing a lot of his. So, I mean, both players were kind of playing a little sloppy, but yeah. it, it did end up in Phaser's uh, favor at the end of the game there because Harstam just didn't catch fast enough that he was making tons of zealots. He himself, his zealots weren't strong enough. And uh, he didn't have the count to try to deal with them, so... Yeah, it happens. You know, it's just Harstam's inconsistency that sometimes surprises me. Um, nevertheless, yeah. guys, this was Cast My Game, episode number three. Special guest, Nostalgia Talix, uh, right now, waving his hands yet again. I Aye. have to say, I enjoyed it quite a lot. It's uh, It's been sweet. You're quite a funny guy. Easy Thank going, you. nice to nice to cast with. So I'm extremely casual. Yeah. And ridiculous so I, yeah i guess that's kind of my my thing i'm just a ridiculous mm. person too bad so. there is like eight hours between us because i mean it's easier for you to do events with me here in europe due to the time difference as long as you can take a day off from work but it's Which impossible today, so. yeah <laughs> but it's impossible for me to start casting at 2 a.m 
because that yeah, would that's, wake that's the whole true. flat up. I would get beaten down by my by my flatmates, so that's not an ideal situation for me by a long shot. Well, you know what we're just gonna have to do. We're just gonna have to submit our entries to be Dreamhack caster or community casters next time together. So that's just what we'll have to do. Oh uh, yeah, we could we could try to do that as well. We can do whatever we want. You know right, why? Because so... we aren't constrained by the man. <laughs> yeah. He's busy with other things. He doesn't care about. Yeah. <laughs> All right, but, so uh, yeah, no, it was great casting with you as well. It's very easy to cast with you. All right, so where where can people find you if they if they want to check uh, more check out more of your stuff? You do have a Twitter, I believe. So if, if you could I link do have that. A Twitter. Yeah. That so guys, be... you guys can follow me on Twitter. I'm about to post it in chat right now. Twitter.com forward slash. Okay, so it's Twitter.com forward slash Nostalgia In fact, I have a promotion going on right now. If I hit our 300 followers by July 1st my time not yours um i'm giving away a free uh hour of coaching with quantic apocalypse um so i mean if you guys want push me up to 300 and that's going to be going to one of the followers there so pretty cool you guys can follow me on my facebook channel as well at facebook.com forward slash nostalgia talix i'm you type in something.com forward slash nostalgia talix you're probably gonna find me probably all right probably so before we go off guys you heard it here first twitter at nostalgia talix uh, a promotion if you can get him to 300 followers on Twitter before July 1st uh, Canada time then you'll get a free coaching from Quantic Apocalypse um, yeah. and before I sign off I'm just going to recite all the names in the chat of the people that have tuned in today so hello there to uh, Das Paxta, David Thor, Deadmead1555, Destra SC2, Gwynblade, Hordon, Jacko underscore P, Mac <laughs> uh Sir Doji, Tenzu was a hundred was a was a was a and uh, I guess I guess that's it so I'm gonna be signing off you guys have a great evening be sure to tune in tomorrow 4 p.m. CEST followers tournament number nine cast by me and a guy that you all love and have not seen for a long time mr. Wardy over from UK from the SC to improve group and uh, we're going to have ourselves another tournament with another winner that's going to take home $32. So uh, I've been Beau Noir. My co-caster and co-host today has been Nostalgia Talix. And we'll see you guys next time. Until that time comes, just stay safe, good luck, have fun, and remember to storm first and ask questions later. And eat more fish because it's brain food. Bye, guys.